As some of you may be aware, I just recently joined that club by uh, Governor West Moore. It's called the Short Haircut. <laughs> some people been there, right, Larry Diggs? So uh, those of us who are members of that club, it's a special club. It will come as a result of us getting older. It's a God's blessing in many ways. Let me say to the master, he who put wetness in water. To the master, he who put blue in the sky and allow birds to fly. To the master, as we come to gather this, this evening to celebrate the contributions of a great people, a people who've been able to sustain even in the roughest of times, a great people who even in those dark days, you could hear Mahalia Jackson singing How I Got Over. In those days where controversy was an issue, can you hear Billie Holiday singing Strange Fruits? Some of you I know who've had that moment where love has hit you, heard per Percy Sledge said, when a man loves a woman. My, 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 we come tonight to celebrate entertainers. We come to celebrate artists. We come to celebrate a culture that has sustained the world. I often tell people the biggest mistake that is made about black history. They tell us that black history started in the 1920s. Oh, I wish people knew our history. Griots was telling our story long before the 1920s. There were people who were storytellers. It was their job to record our history and pass it on from one generation to another. Alex Healy, the story Roots is about a man telling a story to his children who would later tell it to their children. That's history. Let me say I'm so delighted to be here with our county executive who under his administration Six years ago, we started this program, and it speaks for itself. Would you please join me in giving him a round of applause for making this program a reality? I was actually the county executive that he wanted to introduce the elected officials. No, you, you go ahead and do that. <laughs> so if I miss anybody. Yes, <laughs> right. Where's Dana at? Dana, could you stand running for the Board of Education, District 5? <laughs> One of the brilliant women I love who understand politics. Janice, would you please stand? Central Committee, <laughs> making a difference in the world. She's not on that side of the room, she's on this side of the room. Judge Vicki Gibson, the first First African American to be appointed chief judge by Governor Westmore. We then have Priscilla Monroe representing the Central Committee. And a new role, but if one who's given to a lot to this community, the Honorable Jacqueline Awesome. Would you please stand? Delegate Shanika Henson needs no introduction. Last night or the other night, she was honored by the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture, along with Governor Westmore, Speaker Adrian Jones, and myself. Delegate Shanika Henson. <laughs> Connor, Con Connor Curran, Central Committee. Connor? You're in the wrong seat. You're supposed to be over there. <laughs> Jessica Cook. Jessica. <laughs> Delegate Dana Jones. <laughs> did y'all not get the message? The elected officials are supposed to be on that side. Did I, did I, did I miss something? Okay. 
the chair of the county council, Allison Pickard. Would you please stand? <laughs> Allison. The longest serving member of the Annapolis City Council, Council the Honorable Sheila Finlayson. <laughs> County Councilman Pete Smith. Pete, would you please stand? <laughs> Pete, wait, I mean, we can't take <laughs> Delegate Gary Simmons, would you please stand? The person that chairs the only all-female legislative district in District 30, the Honorable Sir Afray, Senator. <laughs> and representing one of my favorite congresspersons, John Sawbanes, is his representative, Bridget Smith. Bridget. <laughs> and very quickly, Bridget, we're still trying to coordinate a, th a date and a time with uh, Congressman Sawbanes, where we're going to have a community celebration, thanking him for his many, many years of service. Our newest member on the Anne Arundel Board of Education, the Honorable Gloria Dent. Sister Gloria. Okay, thank you. And now we're going to be favored by a musical selection from Brother Fisher. How you doing, brother? <laughs> Take a leg. You're going to do all right. Good evening, everybody. up there beyond the sky it's been a long long time coming but i know change gonna come oh yes it will see i go to the movies Telling me no, don't hang around. It's been a long, long time coming, but I know change gone. Yeah. 
Let's give him another round of applause. We overlooked my cousin. Now, you know that's an error. My cousin got overlooked. She is probably the knowledge, one of the most knowledgeable individuals. If you ever want to know something about parole, you want to know about history, I asked Rhonda Pendell Charles, why are these streets named after various persons in your community? And she gave me a history lesson. Please welcome the Honorable Rhonda Charles Pinnell. <laughs> Alderman Ward 3. I keep saying to people over and over again, Elections matter. There's a consequence. There's nothing more important, in my humble opinion, than what's coming up this year, 2024. For those of us who are 40 and over, this election is not about us. It's about our children and our grandchildren. When we elect people to public office, they represent our hopes, our dreams, and our aspirations. I'm a native of Anne Arundel County. I know every county executive that ever served, not because I'm that old, but because the government is relatively young. I know them all, from Joe Alton, who's our first county executive, Robert Pascoe, Janet Owens, I had the privilege of working for. She was the first woman to get elected. As our county executive, I knew Lord Newman, Bobby Neal, John Gary. Over the years, I have known them, Steve Shue. But of all the county executives that we've had, in my opinion, the one who's been the most attentive to the needs of our community, the one who have went along to help make Anne Arundel County better and not bitter, is the man I'm going to introduce in a moment. When you elect people to public office, they run on a platform. That's why it's important to know who you're voting for. And his motto became, make Anne Arundel County the best place for all. That is an aspiration. That is what we are trying to do. But to have someone who's willing to walk with a community and its citizens to make this a better place. Please join me in welcome to the podium, the Honorable Stuart Pittman. Thank you, Carl. Um, he's trying out his short ha haircut, and I've been told tonight I need a haircut bad. <laughs> so um, I don't know if I could pull off the Westmore Carl Snowden haircut. You think I could? Yeah. No. <laughs> I hear a no in the background. Don't worry, I won't try that. Um, so welcome to the few of the many Anne Arundel counties. <laughs> Anne Arundel County's signature Black History Month event. Um, we, we started this in 2019 and it was in room 161 of the Arundel Center. You know that room, the one that's like a bowling alley? It's about this wide and it goes on forever and we got a couple of conference tables in it. Well, that's where we started this event. And it was me handing out a few citations and uh, a lot of people showed up. So we moved it to, the, uh, to Quiet Waters Park 
um, the Blue Heron Room, and it filled up, and we couldn't we we couldn't we couldn't accommodate everybody who wanted to participate. Um, so I want to thank the folks who put on tonight um, and who brought this event to Maryland Hall. This is. This thing just keeps on growing. So, so I will say that Carl, as the convener of the Caucus of African American Leaders, um, he brought the proposal. He's he pushes every year to make it bigger. Um, I guess we say yes every year too, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I want to thank Dee Goodwin, who's always there, um, right behind Carl, pushing and doing a lot of the work. Um, But I particularly want to thank some of my staff in my office, our community engagement and constituent services staff, um, the director, Vincent Molden, uh, Tiana Parker, um, <laughs> Hannah Thompson and the whole crew, and then Colleen Joseph, who works out of our office um, to do special events and handle the details and make things happen. So thank you, Colleen, as well. So, <clears throat> so I started my Black History Month two nights ago. It was Friday night, wasn't it? Friday night at St. John's College. Um, and it was the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture. And uh, I think there were about six honorees, maybe a few more. Carl was one of them. The governor was one of them. Shanika was one of them. Um, the governor made a, um, remarks that were not written down, but um, could have been written into a book, and, and it probably would have sold a lot of copies. Every single word um, just moved me and reminded me that every year Black History Month is absolutely essential. Um, for him, it was about the shoulders that he, that he stood on to get where he is um, and talked about his inauguration day starting down at, at the docks. Um, and then there were people recognized that night who I didn't know, like a guy named Paul Coates, who was the Maryland leader of the Black Panther Party and who started the Black Classic Press, publicly honored. He did a lot of work since then. Um, and uh, he told a story about a guy named Carl Snowden, 16-year-old boy, <laughs> who used to get on the bus from Annapolis and go up to Baltimore and pick up a big arm load of these publications and take them back to Annapolis. And then he'd come up the next week with the money from selling them and he'd get the, ne the next week's uh, edition. Um, imagine that. Carl's right that black history didn't start in the 1920s in this county. In this county, for the last 400 years, most of that time, the population of Anne Arundel County has been pretty close to half black. Folks who built the county, folks who made the roads, folks who built the state house. So for us not to recognize Black History Month, for us not to have a major event like this, would be ignoring the history that every one of our young people needs to learn, every one of our adults needs to learn, regardless of how it makes us feel, because it's fact. And nobody will ever stop us from telling that history. And we're telling more and more and more of it. I'm learning more and more and more of it every year. I'm sure I'll, I'll learn more tonight. But tonight, <clears throat> we took a little bit of a different path on this event. We always recognize people who are making history in our county. And we've recognized folks in every line of work. Um, and, and tonight, we're recognizing people who do the arts, who produce art, people who promote art black artists. And when I think about that, I think about, I, p I think about movements. I think about change. I think about the way art and artists and art productions are able to say things that sometimes you don't quite want to say in words. Sometimes people don't really want to hear and you put it into a play or you put it into a 
piece of art and you reach their souls, even if their brains aren't quite ready for what you have to say. And I know some of the people in this room have done that. Um, I know when you walk into Banneker Douglas um, uh, Museum, you see it, uh, the displays that keep coming through. Um, and we have, to, we have to promote that art and we have to honor those, those artists. So we have a lot of history to make in Anne Arundel County. We will continue to do that. We've got a bill before the General Assembly, Assembly right now giving our Human Relations Commission subpoena powers finally. We've got um, housing legislation that we're working on. Um, we're, we're addressing the opportunity gap in our schools with Dr. Bedell and doing, we're doing, we're doing great work. I believe we're doing the work that impacts black folks, white folks, Latino folks, everybody. Um, but we're not ignoring black history when we do it. But <clears throat> we have some things coming up that, that I am particularly excited about. And one in particular, I'm gonna go ahead and make a sales pitch for it because I'm so excited about it. So we have uh, Kyle Williams and Commissel Brown working together. Uh, their company is Tunnel Vision. Uh, Chase Your Dreams Initiative is a nonprofit. And um, I brought them together with staff from the governor's office, staff from my agencies, some private sector employers and potential sponsors um, to do a presentation this week about an event on March 9th and 10th. It is a gun violence, youth gun violence prevention weekend. Um, and uh, it is about listening to black youth. Um, remember the BET Teen Summit? Anybody remember that way back? They're not doing it anymore, but you know what? The guy who hosted it will be in Anne Arundel County on March 10th doing the Teen Summit for us. <clears throat> and we will have a large audience. We will have a lot of young men and women talking about their experiences and talking about gun violence and talking about fear and anxiety and talking about how to engage and, and solve these problems. Um, so I, I hope people put it on their calendars. Um, the all day session Saturday will be educational. Uh, Sunday will be at, that will be at Severn High School. Sunday will be at Mead, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Severn, Severn, the Severn Center, the new Severn Center is on Saturday. Um, Sunday is uh, Mead High School. And there'll be some, um, some pretty famous folks playing basketball that day. Um, I can't make any announcements because we haven't got commitments, but I think there may be an amazing one-on-one, -on -one, don't you think, between the su superintendent and somebody really famous who both think that they're pretty good. Um, so we're putting all this together, and, and, um, and to me what it's all about is listening and, and meeting people where they are and addressing the biggest issues that we have in our, in our society. And I'm damn excited about all of it, but I'm really excited about tonight. So I'll sit down, stop talking, and uh, hopefully hear some more music too. <laughs> One thing that I should have said in an introduction regarding Stewart, he was the first county executive to endorse Westmore. And this is when nobody else thought Westmore could win. So thank you, Stewart, again. <laughs> now we're going to be favored with the poem by Khalees. Good evening, everybody. My name is Khalees Slade. I'm a poet, and I'm going to be reading two poems for you guys. The first one is called Equally Yoked. Black. What is black, really? Describe it. You know black when you see it. Black is everywhere and always in. Can only describe black as dark, but it's dark every day. So how come we only get a month to celebrate our darkness if it's dark every day? Dark was never celebrated, but the best things never happened during the day, and the worst things never happened at night. Darkness was sent here on purpose, so we have a purpose. We have to be dark so that there can be light. People hid in the shadows and knew that they would be saved because it was dark. Job told me the stars of dawn were black and the hope for light, but let there be none only because after a while, dark and light didn't get along. 
supposed to be equally yoked with all believers in the dark and light, but unequally with the unbelievers. Black was there before time. Black was there before you, your mom, your grandmother. Black has been here. So to carry that title of black in my skin and my blood has been an honor to know what it feels like to be equally yoked. Thank you, thank you. And my second one is called Origin. I'm from, when the street lights come on, you better be in the house, not knowing if it was because my unsafe neighborhood or my parents being overprotective. I'm from eating noodles for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But if we had guests, we switched it up to TV dinners and snacks. I'm from getting judged by how dark my skin is from the same people who walk on dirt like the skin, same color my skin is. From the family dinners meaning something only if it's a holiday and the family gatherings work and if we're on vacation, I mean, I just don't understand why can't we be a family? It's like you on my side when they watching the behind closed doors, it's a bunch of threats being thrown around. I mean being looked at differently in a predominantly white area and feeling different because I was convinced I'll never meet their standards. I'm from Annapolis. Thank you. Let's give her another round of applause. Let me take a personal privilege here. I'm just so delighted. I got two of my grandchildren in the audience. And Fame, I just want him to be recognized. Fame, would you stand? This is Fame. Give Fame. I want to give you one quick announcement, and then we're going to move in to the awards. We still have problems facing our community and our nation. Did you know that poverty is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States? We call all who demand equal rights for all and the abolition of poverty and who believe in the unity of love, not the divisions of hate. Join us on, join us in Annapolis, Saturday, March 2nd, 2000. 24 at 11 a.m. at the State House. Tony, would you stand? Tony Pratt Strong, would you please stand? Is she still with us? There she is in the back. See, Tony? Tony's one of the people that's leading this effort. There is a slogan, a luta continua. The struggle continues. Let me just say the next group of people we're going to be honoring. I'm just so proud of them. Oh, I'm proud of them. You know, one of the things I want people to know before turning this mic over is to share an experience, and you just don't know it. There can be people walking among us today, and I've done this, I've seen it, and you don't recognize their greatness until it's too late. I remember Joe Madison, the Black Eagle. Oh, those of us who had the privilege of knowing him. Joe, what I love about tonight is we're saying to these artists, we recognize your greatness. We don't have to wait until you pass. We see you now. We see what you do. I met Rosa Parks in Annapolis, at Annapolis, at First Baptist Church. Quiet woman, small woman. I love telling this story. A reporter asked Mrs. Parks, why did you refuse to give up your seat to a white man in 1955? And I will never forget Mrs. Parks' answer. Mrs. Parks said in that soft voice, I did not refuse to give up my seat to a white man I refuse to give up my dignity. It's important that our artists tell our story and the people we're honoring tonight tell our story. They make sure that the history is properly recorded. So Chanel Johnson is gonna help with this as we come out, Courtney. Let's give 
my favorite director. A round of applause, and we're gonna have you take it from here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Let's give none other than Carl Snowden, history maker, amongst us, another round of applause. <laughs> How's everybody doing tonight? Okay, okay. Um, well, I'm so happy to be here, and uh, this year, 2024, is the national black history theme for 2024 is what? Black arts. The Association for the Study of African American Life and History has announced 2024 as the year to celebrate, to honor, and to uplift uh, black artists in the visual and performing arts um, throughout the country. And what better place than to kick that off in, a, in our state's capital? You know, when I was reading the bios, um, it kind of like brought me back. Um, reading the bios of all these amazing uh, creatives in our, in our county, and it brought me back to 2003 when I was getting my undergrad in painting at uh, Rutgers University, and I would sit in my art history classes, very similar to this setup here, and um, the art history teacher will teach us about uh, the great artists of. Um, of, of our time, right? Uh, and none of them, or very few of them, were black artists. And so when I read the bios, I thought to myself, you know, this is my time, right? <laughs> to, to, to rewrite that history for myself. So I'm going to be acting as the art historian. Um, you are the class, and we're going we're gonna to learn about some black art here tonight. Is that right? <sighs> So the first artist that we will honor and learn more about is Greta Chapman McGill. Greta is a U.S. Take Notes class. Greta is a U.S.-based artist specializing in acrylic oils, collage, and other elements. She uses her, her art as a narrative painter, delving into the experiences of the black American woman. Greta's artistic approach emphasizes her ability to capture the world through the lens of the black woman. Her painting serves as a powerful medium for storytelling, allowing viewers to step into a different perspective and experience. She is an abstract figurative painter her paintings serve as a powerful medium to tell stories, antidotes, uh, and powerful lessons. Greta believes in the current era as a transitional period in history carrying immense responsibility. Her painting serves as a reflection of this belief, capturing the essence of a transformative time and the weight it holds. Her central theme, of the, the central theme of her work is to celebrate black and indigenous souls. Her art pays homage to those who face historical challenges, showcases resilience, dreams for the future, and the power to give more. Greta's artistic perspective connects to the broader context of today and the past, and prompts viewers to reflect on their roles in shaping the future with the idea of responsibility in the face of historical transitions. I have known Greta for a number of years uh, as an artist and as a thought leader. Uh, she's also dedicated to uh, preserving um, African-American heritage sites as her work as a um, art conservator because she's done work for our museum and our collections department, as well as showcasing her work on our exhibit walls. Um, she is a powerful soul uh, and an educator, a soul sister, and if you know her, you love her, and you're continuously inspired by her. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, your artist, Greta Chapman McGill.
class, are we taking notes? <laughs> All right. The next artist, speaking of amazing black women, uh, Tawny Chapman. Tawny is a Maryland-based photography, ba she's a Maryland-based artist whose work uh, delves in mixed media photography. Tawny's transformative journey led her to shift from commercial photography to a higher calling after documenting her father's cancer battle in 2010. This experience became the catalyst for a shift in her artistic focus and perspective. And, and I'll, I'll, let me just go off script just for a second. Isn't that the power of, of the arts, that you can take something so painful um, and transform it, transform it to uh, impact and ex inspire other, others? Raise your hand if you saw Tawny's masterpiece um, at the Banneker Douglas Museum. All right. Chapman's unique approach is characterized by a lack of strict adherence to traditional photography practice practices. So she's a rebel. <laughs> the multimedia layer nature of her work, incorporating photography, digital collage, hand embellishments with acrylic paint, 24 karat gold leaf, and various materials, including semi-precious stones, contribute to the richness and uniqueness of her pieces. Chapman's choice of featuring her family as subjects in her art and personal connections add depth and, emotional and, mo and emotion to her work, creating a powerful narrative within each piece. As her work addresses the historical absence of black bodies in Western art, providing representation and challenges existing in, in existing narratives, her work highlights the intersectionality of identity as a black woman and mother of three. Her personal experiences and perspectives shape her artistic vision and contribute to the depth of her storytelling. You can see her work in numerous institutions and museums throughout the nation, um, from the Baltimore Museum of Art to the Banneker Douglas Museum. Um, she was recently had an incredible feature in Upstart Magazine, and this artist is, you need to know who she is. <laughs> put, it, put it that way, okay? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Johnny Chapman. So, so as I'm reading some of the visual artists work, I'm not gonna, I won't be mad if you Google some of their work just to see it as I read it because it's incredible. The next artist is, I mean, we are on a black sister roller coaster today, okay? Um, Miss Naya Curtis, Naya. I heard a whoo, 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 I love it, okay. Um, we didn't do this in our history in 2003, okay? All right, um, Naya is a seasoned visual artist and owner of eye-opening photography. Um, she is dedicated to capturing genuine beauty and storytelling through her images, setting the tone for presentation on her unique approach to photography. Her key characteristics in her work emphasize the signature style marked by realism, excitement, and passion. These elements contribute to the emotional impact and storytelling within her photographs. She believes in the power of visual storytelling and why Naya's images really resonate is because they touch you on a deeper level. You see yourself, uh, you see your family, you see your community. Um, Naya's philosophy in her photos serve as a source of nourishment for the mind and soul. Naya col has collaborated with organizations and individuals such as, I'm gonna plug it again, the Banneker Douglas Museum, 
<laughs> um, she's won many awards um, so from the Arts Council of Anne Arundel County, um, Leadership Anne Arundel. Um, she's, document, she's worked with Marilyn Hall and a num number of partners uh, throughout her artistic journey. Naya is also the co-author to Nijan Curriculum, um, exploring the focus of the curriculum on social and emotional development and trauma recovery through the performing and visual arts. I mean, my goodness. A round of applause, okay, for Miss Naya Curtis. Okay, Miss Hannah told me to tell y'all um, that uh, to learn more about the artwork, there's a QR code on the poster board at the entrance theater. All right, so the next person, I didn't even know this person was an artist, uh, is Dr. <laughs> Eric Edward Elston. I mean, give it up. <laughs> he just does so much. Um, many of you know that um, Dr. Eric Elston is a devoted servant leader with a lifelong commitment to inspiring and motivating youth. Um, he has a career uh, in youth and community development for the last 25 years. He has served his community through his significant uh, involvement in leadership and Arundel flagship program and many others. Dr. Elston is an active has is an active board member on various boards, such as like the best festival on the planet, the Kuta Kente Alex Haley Foundation, Annapolis and Anne Arundel Scholarship Trust, Chesapeake Crossroads, and the Wiley H. Bates Center. Uh, he is also appointed, I mean, clap it up. He is also <laughs> appointed by the mayor as keeping our history and culture alive. He is appointed as Annapolis Heritage Area Commissioner and allows for the showcasing um, um, this work in the broader community initiatives. Um, he's also, this is what I did not know. He has a, he is forayed in documentary filmmaking um, setting to address intricate issues of race, culture, and education in America. Um, he provides platforms for youth, families, and communities to achieve their goals, dreams, and ambitions. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Eric Edward Elston. This should be a class in Annapolis Black Arts History, or Anne Arundel Black Arts History. This is awesome. All right. The next person who I know and love dearly is Darren Gilliam. <laughs> okay. Darren Michelle Gilliam is a dedicated creative director and arts facilitator right here in Annapolis. She is homegrown. Uh, Darren has um, furthered the arts, creating opportunities for artists, providing design and consulting services for over 15 years, which meant she got started when she was like 10. <laughs> Darren represents the best of Annapolis. She is co-owner of Art Farm Studios, where she collaborates with her business partner, Allison Harbo. Providing services including arts, education, events, gallery space, and creative rental space across their two studios. Um, as a creative, she also uh, works with her partner to produce Annapolis Arts Week and Anne Arundel Arts Month. Darren serves as a proud board member of the Arts Council of Anne Arundel County. Um, she is a curator, she is an educator, she does everything with excellence and pre precision, and she is just an incredible person to know. Not to mention, she is a proud wife and mother of two. Ladies and gentlemen, Darren Gilliam.
All right. Ladies and gentlemen, First Lady Lorraine Jones. Woo! I know that's, that's our babies right there, y'all. Okay. <laughs> First Lady Lorraine Jones is a musical talent whose life has been harmonized with, by a deep passion for music since an early age. Her upbringing in a preacher's household is where the church served as her musical training ground. Lorraine's early musical experiences started in the church beginning with childhood solos in the mass choir. Lorraine rapidly progressed in her musical career, directing choirs and performing with renowned artists like Mandisa and Minister Stephen Hurd by age 22. Her role in leading worship for thousands at youth conventions showcases her impactful presence in the gospel community. Her solo project, It's Time for Worship, released on December 1st, 2015. Can you find that on Apple Music? Yes, okay. <laughs> And its success with over 10,000 copies sold, resonating on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, Lorraine's current role as devoted psalmist at Fowler and Cecil United Methodist Churches, right here in Annapolis, emphasizes her unwavering commitment to genuine praise and adoration, rooting in biblical truth and guidance by the strict by the Scripture. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Married to her husband, Reverend Jerome Jones Sr., for over 24 years, her commitment to genuine praise and adoration extends beyond her musical career and her professional life and relationships. And her tribe is here today <laughs> representing. <laughs> Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, First Lady Lorraine Jones. Okay. All right. So next we have the Knight Brothers, Equavion, and Leonard Lenny, lifelong residents of Anne Arundel County, creative directors and producers highlighting that, and they are committed to community well being through the Knight Brothers show, a dynamic platform addressing health social, political, and community topics. Equavion Knight has been dedicated to education in, the, in, in, in this county school system for over 40 years. <laughs> he is a health and financial freedom advocate, emphasizing his belief that health is a part of hidden wealth. Equavion adoption of intermittent fasting. I'm, I'm trying to work on that, y'all. Intermittent fasting is it's hard. We got to talk after. Okay. Is has a lifelong and transformative impact led to his mission to share its vision, its benefits through social media. Lenny Knight Jr., his brother, is an edu has an educational background in advocacy where he prioritizes health and adult lives. Lenny's role as a host and curator of the Knight Brothers show emphasizes its weekly podcast, emphasize, is emphasized on their weekly podcast format on Facebook and YouTube. Some of their guest highlights include Anne Arundel County Executive Stuart Pittman. <laughs> Annapolis Mayor Gavin Buckley, and Grammy Award-winning rapper Rakim. Incredible. The diverse perspectives brought by guests at, do y'all know who Rakim is, right? 
Okay. Ain't nothing but sweat inside my hand. Okay. All right. Um, <laughs> the Knight Brothers focus, the Knight Brothers show's focus is on local youth and entrepreneurs highlighting their achievements and contributions to inspire and motivate the community and emphasize the importance of showcasing local talent and success stories for community engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, the Knight Brothers. Now, if you don't know this gentleman, you are living under a rock. <laughs> Bishop Antonio Palmer. <laughs> Bishop Antonio Palmer is the senior pastor of Kingdom Celebration Center and the presiding bishop of the Kingdom Alliance of Churches International. His diverse roles as a business owner include author, graphic designer, digital artist, and commitments to, li to family life. Bishop Palmer's role as senior pastor of Kingdom Celebration Center emphasizes his work guiding and nurturing the spiritual community. His broader impact as the presiding bishop um, for these churches showcases his commitment to fostering unity and collaboration amongst churches. Bishop Palmer's inter entrepreneurial side includes owning two businesses, Kingdom Care Incorporated and Kingdom P Publishing LLC. The significance of these ventures has contributed deeply to community development and empowerment. It's so important for us to own publishing companies. Bishop Palmer's role as author with five life-changing books underscores his commitment to sharing transformative insights and wisdom while en enhancing his personal development and spiritual growth. Bishop Palmer's take takes pride in being a husband, I know that's right, father and grandfather and understands the significance of family values in his life and how they influence his approach to leadership and community service. Bishop Palmer inspires and empowers individuals within his congregation and the wider community. I'm not even a member of his congregation, he inspires me. So ladies and gentlemen, Bishop Palmer. The knees. <laughs> All right. Um, our next artist is Christian Smooth. <laughs> Christian Smooth has like the best name <laughs> on the planet. Christian Smooth is an award winning filmmaker photographer and artificial intelligence artist, hailing from Annapolis, Maryland. If you have not seen his work, several of his photos, photos and AI have gone viral, um, honoring and celebrating black history. His educational background began at none other than Morgan State University, where he earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts BFA in screenwriting and animation. Christian Smooth's lifelong passion for storytelling serves as a foundation for his career in filmmaking, photography, and AI artistry. 
Some of Christian Smooth's contributions over the past decade as a documentarian are capturing the many prominent events in Annapolis and Anne Arundel County. Much of his work is showcased and featured in various publications. I mean, I don't know if you heard of them, like the New York Post, the Washington Post, Upstart Magazine, and Annapolis, and many others. Christian Smooth's motivation is always created is, is always creating thought-provoking content that leaves a positive impact on the world. Really need to look up his work, it's incredible. Christian Smooth's dedication is pushing boundaries and seeking new challenges in his creative endeavors, demonstrating his willingness to be daring, be innovative, and explore new artistic territories. His involvement in local events, collaborations on initiatives demonstrates his commitment to connecting and contributing, to contributing, contributing to the greater community. And I will say this, he will be uh, guest curating and or having a large part of his artwork uh, featured at the Banneker Douglas Museum in 2026 under the theme Afrofuturism. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Christian Smooth. Great. Um, now we know the Carl Snowden, uh, but I don't know if all of you know his son, Kojo Snowden. <laughs> wow. Kojo Snowden, another powerful name, is a renowned artist born and raised in Annapolis, Maryland who has made a significant impact on the world through his love for music. His early start in music involved creating, writing, and performing his own songs at the age of nine, setting the stage for a remarkable journey. Kojo Snowden's journey began as he earned local recognition and notoriety during his early years, gaining respect beyond the Annapolis area. His precocious talent, no, they say precocious. <laughs> um, that's a nice way of saying that he, he was a rebel in his own right, which as an artist you need to be. His precocious talent set the foundation for his later achievements. Kojo's teenage years are marked by his travels to share his musical talents with audience in different cities, states, and even countries. This geographical scope of his performances showcases the expanding reach of his music. Snowden's work ethic is highlighted by his consistency and dedication to his craft, even as he became a business owner and father. His commitment to performing at multiple venues yearly across various states, including Maryland, Pennsylvania, New York, ATL, highlights Kojo's artistic philosophy of creating music that matters. His commitment to authenticity and staying true to himself has always set him apart from the music industry. Kojo's unique approach to giving back to his community emphasizes that the greatest form of giving is anonymous. His huma humility is driven by his love for hip hop as an art form and music as a universal language. KP Joe's mottos, triple blessed, and we gon' just keep on working, are significant in shaping his mindset and approach to his musical career. Snowden's self-proclaimed self title as the heart of hip hop and how he views hip hop as an art from, the, from which inspires those to dream big and everyone to continue. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, can you find his music on iTunes too? Yes. Oh, yes. yes? Okay. <laughs> Somebody said, oh, yes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Annapolis' own Kojo Snowden.
Well, class, you did a wonderful job this evening. I hope you took good notes, uh, but no be kidding. These are history makers in their own right. These are the folks that you're gonna continue to learn about, read about, and you get to see them right here in person, live, prime time. So make sure you get to know these artists during this event and enjoy the rest of your evening. While they're about to move us into another stage, let's give our honorees another round of applause. <laughs> Here's something that's generally not known. If you know the history of a people, an African people, our art manifests who we are. Just think about it. Think of all of the ver various ways art has helped to influence a movement. It's not by accident that the church, those songs that gave hope, that inspired. I want to take this moment as we clear the stage to go to the next performance. I have learned something that's relatively, I think, important. People often hear me talk about my mother, who lived to be 104 years old. And I always think of what my mother would say. She came to many of the Martin Luther King Jr. dinners. In fact, she came to the very last one before she passed. And we'd have these conversations. Those of you who have parents that in the 80s and 90s and if they get to be 100, you ought to talk to them. They're living history. They can tell you things that nobody else can. Do anybody in this place know how black people survived the depression of 1929? There was no social security. There were no programs that you go to. Black people survived. And my mother said the way, the way it was done is people bought it. Seamstress sold clothes for people. Farmers traded with fishermen. And it's because of that tradition we understand that we've got to support each other. So I wanted to recognize now the Martin Luther King Jr. Committee who made a substantial contribution to make this happen. Would the committee please stand, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Committee. Let's acknowledge them. And I also want to take this opportunity to ask the Caucus of African American Leaders, would y'all please stand? Members from the Caucus of African American Leaders, please stand. Before I bring on Hannah, who's going to take us to this next thing, I want to ask people to put down a date. It's going to be right back here again, February 18th. Please mark your calendar, February 18th. You're going to get a taste of something that you want to come back to. To give us the introduction of the Greater U J Street Jazz Collective, is Hannah Thompson. Would you please put your, no, it's Judge Vicki Gibson. They've changed it. Judge Gibson. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you to the, oh, I'm sorry. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you to the county executive and the staff, Vincent Molden and Tiana. I always have trouble with pronouncing her name, Parker the MLK Committee and the Caucus of African American Leaders, specifically Carl Snowden and Dee Goodwin. Without their efforts, none of this would be possible. So thank you again. Also, congratulations to the honorees with special acknowledgement to Apostle Palmer. 
who works tirelessly at the Kingdom Celebration Center and does so much for our community. But I want us to applaud the awardees again. So thank you so much. With that said, for our closing performance, we have a special treat. The Greater U Street Jazz Collective will perform a selection from the jazz musical String of Pearls. And the, the, it's entitled, Ain't Too Many More of Us Left. The String of Pearls will be performed at Maryland Hall on Sunday, February the 18th at 4 p.m. And since it's a love story, we were hoping that everyone here would get some tickets and bring their Valentine with them to the event and just kind of extend the day of love. So work on that. Okay, you can. <laughs> All right, this, the String of Pearls is a love story with a message. It chronicles the personal love story of Nettie and Sam over decades as they love, as their love for one another grew and as the love for the community that saved them grew. The historical timing of the love story illuminates the intersection between the Great Migration and gentrification. Historians estimate that during the Great Migration, approximately six million blacks moved from the South to the North, Midwest, and Western states from about 1910 to 1970s um, to escape racial violence, lynchings, mutilations, routine humiliations, and to pursue economic and educational opportunities, um, and also to obtain freedom from the oppression of Jim Crow. This is major, but what I realized it, that um, with this migration and the significance of it, we just don't talk about it. We don't talk about how that impacts our daily lives or our families and what changes happened as a result of that. Um, perhaps it's because of the generational trauma endured by African black, I mean, African blacks, American <laughs> blacks as untouchables in an enduring race-based caste system despite the dissolution of slavery. Like many, my family has a great migration story. My great-grandfather, a president of a small college in South Carolina, one day quietly packed up his family and disappeared into the night after being threatened by the local KKK. They said they were gonna lynch him, so he left before that could happen. Everybody's circumstances were different. In Nettie and Sam's case, they fled the inhumanity of sharecropping, which was just barely a step above slavery and which was facilitated by Jim Crow, Jim Crow laws created that created unbearable oppression and economic bondage that they could no longer endure, so they fled. Nettie and Sam settled in the greater U Street neighborhood of Washington, D.C., which was a thriving black community called the String of Pearls. They grew to love their community dearly, only to be confronted decades later with gentrification the process where their so-called yuppies and other primarily white investors come into economically suppressed neighborhoods and through urban renewal and other perceived nefarious mechanisms to force black folks out of their communities that create a safe landing during the Great Depression. This begs the question of what can be done to repair these community bonds in a way that addresses the needs of everyone in our communities especially the most vulnerable, to preserve communities rather than break them. Every community has their version of a string of pearls. For Annapolis, it is the old fourth ward. It is time for us to repair our communities so that we can all thrive. I hope that you will join us for this Black History Month event at Maryland Hall and get the tickets for, you can get tickets for string of pearls um, on February the 18th, the tickets can be purchased through the Maryland Hall events page. With that said, I'm excited to introduce to you the Greater U Street Jazz Collective with special thanks to collective member Art Cobb, who's unable to perform today, but who is an inextricable part of the group. Please make some noise as I introduce the members of the coll collective. We're gonna start with Victoria Njadeka. Stand up. She is the director of the String of Pearls, and she's done a phenomenal job. There's also Thomas View playing bass, 
Thomas is the playwright, the visionary, and he's my classmate from high school. <laughs> we also have uh, Rodney Mathis on drums, Pete Frazran on piano, and our very own Michael Postaway on saxophone or flute, I'm not sure which. <laughs> Um, and the very talented Cindy Brown providing vocals. So thank you very much. We're looking forward to it. Back when back was beaming with pride and jelly roll and letty brought us along for the ride and bam i played nancy not one time but two and old nat turn remind us don't forget the blues well there ain't too many more of us left there too many more of us left. Now some say good riddance, to others it's a theft, but you know there ain't too many more of us left. Remember Disco Dan and General Hassan on the side of every wall. Blackbirds in Rock Creek Park. Between Dotties and Benz, everybody got served while the mighty burner was ringing lightning to the dark well. There ain't too many more of us left. No, 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 there ain't too many more of us left. Now you might have all the answers, so you might know. Tell me why ain't too many more of us left. bus at the break of high noon chuck at mama sons and roberta in full bloom while frondo green had us rolling on the floor nina for five dollars at the cellar door well, there ain't too many more of us left no no they took the a train on For a $30 glass of wine And you can sometimes catch junkyard Someplace out in Ward 9 And no sentimental musings Will stop the turn of the tide Because ain't no turning back from what's next Ain't no smooth way out of this mess It's a lot less like Chocolate City in many respects but there ain't too many more of us left 
Some celebrate the miracle. Some feel it's quite eff. How they're y'all let's give them another round of applause I want to make a special appeal to the elected officials we want this place to be packed with children young people to witness this incredible performance so those of you uh, is Priscilla still with us there she is those of you who are able to assist in bringing young people to this performance we want young people people from Mead Village, people from Freetown, people from Newtown. We need our young people to witness this incredible play. This play is a play that every single person should see. So those of you in the audience who's able to assist, we're gonna try to fill the place up. I want people to be here, because this performance is worth celebrating. Our history and our culture now, according to what I'm supposed to say at this point <laughs> is to say thank you. I'm supposed to do a conclu uh, concluding remarks, but what I want to do is ask uh, Vincent, could you come forward? Tiana, D. Goodwin. Now, I just want people to understand, this doesn't happen by accident. Courtney, and what's What's Sister Joseph? Colleen. Colleen, please come forward as we say quickly. <laughs> we'll wait for Dee as she comes up. I want to close the program by again thanking these, these individuals. People don't know what, it go, what work it takes to go into this. Uh, county executive talked about how this program has grown over the years, and it has. I want to remind somebody, it's in the booklet, but I want to remind you. There's a program that was created um, six years ago along with a few of the many. It's called the Michelle Obama Awards. It's next month. It's going to be here at this facility. And at that event, we honor women women from every racial background, women. And if you really know the history of America, you know that women have played a incredible role, but often has been marginalized. People have often taken for granted the role that women have made. So the Michelle Obama Awards is just to indicate that we have women doing outstanding things here in Anne Arundel County. So it's March 25th, please mark your calendar. February 18th, Strings of Pearls, then come back again on March 25th for the Michelle Obama Awards. And again, I wanna, on behalf of the caucus, thank the administration, thank these incredible people who've done incredible work. Let's give them a round of applause. We're on time, so let me just end with this. I always do this. I really, really believe it's important. For those who've come many times, you know where I'm going. But for those of you who've been here for the first time, I couldn't be more sincere when I say this to you. I often think of the contributions that was made by many, and Dr. King, we all love him and praise him. 
his youngest son, Dexter King, as many of you know, recently passed from prostate cancer. And then shortly thereafter, he died from prostate cancer. We had, of course, the Black Eagle, Joe Madison died. I cannot emphasize enough for men to take that examination. It need not happen. We can save lives. Martin Luther King Jr.'s uh, father spoke here in Annapolis many years ago. Most people don't know this. Martin Luther King's mother was assassinated. You'd be surprised the number of people that don't know that. And in 1974, while at a church service, a black man walked up to her and asked, are oh, you Martin Luther King's mother? And without looking up, she said, yes. He then said, oh, you're a Christian. And again, she's in a Christian church. Of course she's a Christian. She said, yes. And then he said, I don't like Christians. And he shot Martin Luther King's mother. He shot five other people. And then in that year, Daddy King, Martin Luther King Jr.'s father, came to speak at Asbury United Methodist Church. And I will never forget what he said, and this is why I keep emphasizing it. Dr. King, uh, Daddy King said, taught him a lot. But the one thing he taught him, and remember, this is a father talking about what his son taught him. Daddy King was in his 80s. He said that his son, Martin King, taught him what love is. Here's Daddy King speaking at Asbury United Methodist Church. His wife has just been assassinated. His son, six years earlier, was assassinated. And those of us in the room, we want to know what would this man say to us with this tragic tragedy happening in his life. And he said the following, paraphrasing, who am I going to hate? Am I, am I going to hate the white man that killed my son? Am I going to hate, he said, the black man who killed my wife? Who am I going to hate? And he went on to say that his son taught him that hate is too great of a burden to bear. And he said Dr. King taught him how to love. That's difficult. So Dr. King's two lessons to us was the following. One, he said, whenever people of goodwill join hands, they make America better. And we've seen it over and over and over again. Women got the right to vote because people of goodwill join hands. Students got the right to vote at 18 because they join hands. King's birthday became a national holiday because people join hands. Wes Moore became governor because people join hands. There is this incredible progress we make when we join hands. But he also said something else, and this is the most difficult thing we've yet to do. Dr. King said we need to learn to love one another. So if you kindly look to your neighbor, either on the right or the left, and just simply say, I love you. Now, for those of you, for those of you who have been like me, you really, if you really lived anything, you know what love is. Kalani, when I was 14, a girl told me I love you and she was with somebody else the next day. So I really know what love is. Please look at your neighbor one more time. The eyes of the window to one's soul. Look them directly in the eye and just simply say, I love you. If you. If you didn't get that tingling feeling. If you didn't feel that flutter of the heart. You understand why we have to continue to try to follow Dr. King's advice about loving one another. Those of you arteries, please stand. We're going to have the county executive join us. We're going to do a group photo um, with the group. And we got certificates. And we have for the band certificates. So before you guys go, 
Michael Postaway first. Michael. Michael. Michael gave the guest appearance tonight. This is from the county executive. Pete. Man, you was good on that horse. Man, you was good. I can't wait to see you. Rodney. The drummer. Remember that thing? Give the drummer some. Come on, give him applause, y'all. Thank you, my friend. Russell Carter. This is the county exec. Russell Carter. Cindy Brown. Thomas Mew. I want to just say, uh, we're going to take, take this photograph in the very moment. But again, I want you to look at these men and women who are being honored. And I kid you not when I say to you that every now and then, God gives us a blessing. And sometimes we miss it. And I'm just so happy that these men and women are being honored. What they've been able to do in terms of affecting people's lives are immeasurable. And I just want you to know from the caucus, from the county executive's office, from the King Committee, we're so proud of you. We're proud of you because you may not even realize the lives you've touched and the people you affected. So would you all join me in giving them one final round of applause to all of our honorees.